Welcome back to another episode of Into the Lion's Den with your co-hosts, Mr. J.D. Stevens. How are we doing? I don't have any good nicknames today. And uh, Christian Griffith brought to you proudly by Pride Roofing and Construction. Still not going to do it. Come on. You're never going to get me to do it. Just say more. Mm, <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. I did it. I took my face away. All right. Um, today we're going to be spinning into um, some entrepreneurial topics. Mm-hmm. You know? We can talk about uh, just kind of the growth and development from start to finish of this organization is what I'm assuming you want to take this on. Um, I mean, we're going to base it off of our ex- the experience of yourself and then also as I've been here of, you know, from this context, but kind of from an entrepreneurial context in general of like these are, I don't feel like the things we run into are isolated to us. Sure. Um, so we're just going to pack it with some ex- personal experiences. Yeah, I get it. Okay. So today we're talking about the startup phase. Yeah. Yeah. Well, how do you want to direct this, Captain Top Bun? It's Diesel. You normally call me Diesel. Let's just stick with Diesel. No. <laughs> There's got to be a new nickname every episode. Captain Top Knot. Top Knot. Top Knot. I almost messed that up. Oh, to what other people call me. So we're just going to move forward. Um, so we're going to tell the big thing, the, the first thing is the inspiration and origin story of like, what either in your background um, led you to start uh, specifically any venture? Because I know that you have other aspirations other than just what we're currently doing. Um, and then um, just how you got started in that. Like, what was the inspiration that led you to here? I know that, you know, there's a lot that goes into that, but. Mm. Yeah. Well, okay. Do you want short answers? Or you want long answers? Uh, I mean, we have all the time in the world. <laughs> Stay clicked in, guys. They promise this is going to be good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Anyways, um, I don't know. I've always known I wanted to run a business, right? Um, I just kind of understood that as a kid. Now, I did I know what I wanted to do? No. I mean, frankly, I didn't know what the heck I wanted to do going into college. I just knew I needed to go to college because that's what everybody said, right? You want to get a job or you want to do something with your life, you got to go to college. College. So I didn't really have direction. I just knew I wanted to create s- something. And my mind has always been more of like a – I excelled really well at things like organic chemistry. And the reason I excelled in organic chem- chemistry is because it makes sense to me. Mechanisms make sense to me, right? My mom always thought I'd make a great engineer because – you know, I'd always find ways to do something without asking people for help. Like, yeah. right, for instance, you know, this this might be morbid to some people. I don't know. But we lived on a small farm. Mm-hmm. And we had um, pigs and cows and chickens and sheep and all kinds of stuff. It, was, it wasn't like a commercial farm. It was a hobby farm, right? And uh, one time, one of our biggest boars died. And it died in a, um, a mud pit. Right. And instead of, you know, going to tell dad or my brother or whoever and uh, renting a backhoe because we didn't have I mean, it wasn't a commercial farm. We didn't have a lot of heavy machinery. They're they're heavy. Yeah. They're very big, very heavy. I devised a way to remove a dead pig from a sunken in mud hole over a six foot fence using levers and pulleys. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, he was about 500 pounds, I think, and uh, I figured it out. My mom thought this was absolutely crazy, and that's where the engineer thing came from. For me, you know, math, I'm, I'm good at math, but only when I put the time and attention into math. Like um, like if I, like my Mr. Henderson, you know, shout out to Mr. Henderson. He's what, He's the reason I had good grades in math because he told me, You will write it down every time, step, start to finish every step on a piece of paper, regardless of how many pages it takes. And I carried that with me for forever. So I was always good at math because I wrote it down. I'm not naturally good at it. I'm no savant. I'm no John O'Brocto where I can just do like (laughs) advanced calculus in my head and all of a sudden, poof, here's your number and everybody thinks you're cheating. I'm not Rain Man, right? (laughs) So engineering didn't really ever sit well with me. So I knew I wanted to be. Um, I knew I wanted to run business. I wanted to create ways to earn money so that I could earn back time. Right? Everybody needs money for fuel. Right? And that's 
just call it life tickets, fuel, whatever you want to call it. I don't really look at money the same way some people look at money. Some people are very motivated by money. Me personally, I'm motivated by what money does for you, which is freedom. I want fuel. I want life passes, whatever I want, uh, you know, whatever I need to do in order to live the life that I think is the one that's going to be the best for me and my family and, you know, whatever. So I knew I always wanted to run a business. I just didn't really know how. Um, I got really, um, I was very pr privileged. And actually one of the reasons that I left um, pursuing medicine or dental medicine, which is actually what I drove into because the same reason I, I knew one of my advisors knew I had a, a mind for business and mechanisms and things like that. And I really got along with her husband who was a dentist. And long story short, I changed routes from wanting to be a doctor to want to be a dentist so I could run my practice. And anyways, I told you this is going to be a, a, a long story. I, you should have told me, make us summarize this thing. But um, anyways, I was taking a lot... Or was that? I was really fortunate. So when I was trying to get into professional school, and if anybody on here has ever tried to apply for professional school, it's very competitive. Um, and actually, most people don't understand this because they don't look at doctors and dentists the same way, you know, like a, a hangover. <laughs> 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 I'm not going to say it because people are going to, you know, that's it's not PC. But anyways, but anyways it's harder to get into dental school than it is to medical school. And the reason is because there's just as many applicants, but there's only a quarter of the amount of school or uh, schools that offer dental okay. medicine, right? Or dental, um, you know, study, right? So you have the same requirements. It's the same classes. It's the same tests. The only difference between the MCATs and the, um, and the, um, the DATs instead of the MCATs, it's the DATs. The only difference is you do visual interpretation and in the, uh, the, the DATs and in the MCATs you do uh, written, so you're losing writing and you're adding 2D and 3D manipulation because right? okay. you got to be able to read x-rays. Sorry, I don't know why I got down this path, but I was trying <laughs> to get into dental school at the time and I had to get a different job because I hated the job I was in. And I started working in the gym industry and I was very fortunate at this time. The person that I interviewed with for a gym that wasn't open yet, um, I was going to become part of this you know, um, startup. Or it wasn't a startup. It was their first in the state because they were in other states. But anyways, happened to be the owner, and he turned into my mentor. Right. Um, he saw something in me that I did not see, um, which was the sales side of me. <laughs> he, he pulled out communication. Like, mechanisms have always made sense. Uh, that uh, this equals this, or this plus this equals this, has always made sense. This is how wheels turn. This is how the clock, you know, whatever. And that's always made sense to me. But getting a product or getting something sold is was the difficult feat. And he was like a Jedi. Right? Okay. He could just wave his hand is what it felt like, and people would just buy things from him. <laughs> you will buy this gym membership. <laughs> you know? And so anyways, he took me under his wing. He taught me how he modeled his business. He taught me the reasons. He taught me how to search and find your your niche markets, how to, you know, was, you know, very surgically place his units. He taught me why he placed his gyms where he did and what the demographics were, who he was searching for, who his best population were, all that stuff. And he had it dialed down. He knew exactly which cities and which states he was going to put his businesses in because it fit his perfect model. So okay. I was like, this guy knows everything. Like he's a wizard, right? Um, Jedi, wizard. He's You're like, a wizard. <laughs> You're a wizard, Jedi. But anyways, he taught me all of my foundation, my business acumen comes, or at least the beginning foundation came directly from Nolan. He taught me how to negotiate well. He taught me how to model a business. He taught me how to manage. He taught me how to lead. He taught me just about everything in business. So my first aspiration, and something that's still on the docket for me, like you mentioned, there's other things I want to do. But once, um, eventually I'm going to open a gym because uh, that's that was where my first passion was. I don't necessarily think I'm going to, push that gym the way that I would have um, prior to starting prior to roofing and construction. It would have been an HVLP that I wanted to, you know, just blow up across the country. This is going to be more like a hobby for me. So I eventually have that, but it was going to be pride fitness. That's where the name pride roofing and construction came from. Pride fitness was the name. Um, actually kind of got stolen. That's a little <laughs> bit about that. Um, <laughs> but uh, sort of, but anyways, um, that's where I got, I guess some some of the background, it's always been there. I've always wanted to just find a way to create a machine that helps me live my life that runs sovereignly, 
right? Right now it's not sovereign because I'm necessary to be here, but the goal is that it runs without me here, right? That's every business owner's dream. Yeah, right? and that's a lot of what, from my system's point of view, of like what you and I do, mm-hmm. of uh, you're, you're entrusting me of like, because you and I talk about the vision quite a bit, we talk about that building sovereign machine mm-hmm. of to where eventually there's a certain set of key people that aren't necessary to be integrally involved mm-hmm. um, day to day. Mm-hmm. Um, first of which being you. Yeah. Yeah. Th- that's the first goal. And it's, and it's not that I don't want to work. Right. Mm-hmm. But it's, it's like, there's a, there's a saying in business. Um, I have mentioned it on here. Well, like I've told everybody, my biggest goal is a fishing trip. Like I can go on a fishing trip right now. Yeah. Right. It's not that I can't go on a fishing trip. It's that I want to be able to leave for an extended period of time to an exotic location where nobody can contact me for a, like I said, a long time and come back and the business is working better than when I left. Yeah. That's the real goal, right? It's, it's, it's much bigger than, you know, throwing hooks. Right? <laughs> um, but anyways, yeah, that's, that's kind of where I got, I've always wanted to be in this position. Now I didn't always want to be in construction. Okay. Actually, not at all. I never even ever intended to be in construction, mm-hmm. right? My, my background is in cell biology and biopsychology, uh, I worked in the gym industry, and I understand physiology and anatomy like you know, like better than most people on a microscopic level. I can tell you what your body's doing when you're when X is happening to you and that kind of stuff. Um, so it, had, it it never was part of my DNA. That was actually something that somebody I met in the gym who used to be my pre- previous business partner. Um, he knew he knew it like the back of his hand. So the thing that we knew about each other is that I had the skills that he didn't have. He had the skills that I didn't have. He had the knowledge about the this industry, um, and I had the um, let's just call it the emotional intelligence and communication skills necessary to take his experience and give it to consumers. Mm-hmm. <laughs> A good yin and yang, right? Definitely. Yeah. So um, yeah, I guess the inspiration and origin story it was. There's more to that. I mean, the, how we heard about, you know, um, the best ways to start this business was actually through um, we met a guy in a uh, <laughs> we met a guy in a hot tub and, you know, a couple decades ago <laughs> and, uh, you know, in a hotel or not a hotel, but a, an apartment complex. And he taught us what the storm chase industry was like versus what the retail um, roofing industry was like versus this versus this. And he had family members. So he's just a generational roofer. So he knew how to do the work, but how to build the business was also something that we had to learn along the way. But long story short, you know, the origin story is kind of weird. I was kind of forced into this. Um, I always knew I wanted to open a business, but I didn't know it was going to be this one. Mm -hmm. So, And, you know, by... I think that's part of it uh, for us is the the yin and yang of there's a lot of us here that aren't necessarily roofers or construction folks, Mm -hmm. um, but we bring our individual, like I'm an audio engineer by trade. So like we talk about, um, you know, the, the engineering of like you and I had that same background. Dad always worked for himself. So this was always, you know, being in a position to like run my own company was always a, a dream of mine also. Um, I just didn't have um, the follow through. I'm a I'm an amazing like I'm an amazing ideas person. I'm not always the most amazing implementation person. Um, so I like being in the role I am because I can help bring those ideas to the table and use that entrepreneur part of my brain of like how can we be better here mm-hmm. and build those things um, alongside somebody else who's going to help rein in the, because I, I, I tend to fall on the scale of, I want year 10 mm. right from the start. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and that's not how business works. Not um, at all. Yeah. And especially, I mean, we've, we've seen it. And so that's kind of the, you know, segues into like our early, ch- our early mm-hmm. challenges. So, uh, what are some of the most significant early challenges we ran into in like the first the first couple of years? Um, like, I know that we had you know getting licensing was a barrier to entry, especially in some of the other locations we work. Um, you know, finding our team and then deciding what products we we're going to sell because there's a lot more that goes into that than just being like I want to sell this because 
sometimes the thing you want to sell isn't available to you right at the start. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, we got laughed out of a, a roofing convention when we first started. We were like two weeks old, and Chris said we're we want to get Carlisle certified. Uh, <laughs> to, um, which nobody watching this unless you're a roofer knows what i just said but <laughs> there's only two people in the state of any state that get carlisle surf- certified like <laughs> and you have to be the best of the best of the best yeah. right and so we're two weeks old and you got to be like 40 years old right but anyways <laughs> so uh, but those are those those initial challenges so like well, what are some of the the biggest challenges like unforeseen and then also that maybe you saw that you know early on were you know um you ran into early challenges it was not see see i was never worried and we've seen that play out neither of us were ever worried about being able to find clients um both of us um when we first started and and it w- i wasn't just the only good salesperson on the team chris was a you know a gifted natural salesperson just different cat but anyways um we never were worried about being able to sell the product. That was never the worry. What what we were worried about was, or that we ran into challenges with, I guess the best way to say that, was selling our family and friends. Um, nobody wants to work for a business that doesn't exist, and nobody wants to work for a business that's a couple of months old and only off of you know you saying, man, this is going to be big, I promise, right? <laughs> right, nobody's going to quit their job for you, you know, that that was really difficult was, those were the hardest sales, uh, really was the hardest sales, was getting your entry-level people, and that turned into another, tra- uh, not entry, but your beginning people, and that turned into another challenge all in, of, uh, in and of itself, because if you can't get strangers to do it, the only people who believe in you enough are friends and family, and I'm here to tell you, it's difficult going into business with your friends and your family members. You are going to lose some of your relationships because things just don't work out the way you think they are when you realize you're not equally yoked, yeah. right? And so, you know, challenges turn into other challenges. Every every year, it's funny, it's a new level Dune Devil, right? We're in a different, you're in a different layer of this, you know, pyramid we're trying to climb. But the challenge, there, there's never a, there's never a day that goes without challenges, and it's always something different, right? You're just getting slapped in the face from reality all the time. So be resilient if you want to be, go out and build a business. But that was one of the early challenges. Uh, financing was or finance, the backing money, yep. money was difficult. Um, we reached out to a, a multitude of different people, people we know who had savings accounts or trust funds and. Uh, banks and all sorts of stuff. Nobody wants to invest into a brand new, no experience roofing company. The bank said, come back in two years if you're still around, you know, friends and family were like, no, you know, so we took what little savings we had between the two of us, pooled it together, and we had to grow. When I say low and slow, I mean low and slow. It was snail pace. It was do this, pay this, get this back, we increased by a percentage. Do this, pay this, get this back, right? It was one after the other, and you couldn't you couldn't do what we wanted to do, which was build mechanisms and onboard, or not onboard, but bring in large amounts of accounts. And, you know, we couldn't manage the business the way that we manage it now because there was no cash flow, right? So we had to bootstrap it into existence. It was one at a time, low and slow, so on and so forth. And so that was difficult. Um, it wasn't impossible. Right, but it was difficult, and we also f- ran into a new. Um, not that we didn't know that this was difficult, but it wasn't us. When we worked in a, for other roofing companies, uh, we always knew that the insurance company was hard to get t- to pay you, right? But we were never on the receiving end of that hard. It was always the owners of those businesses or the, the you know executives and stuff like that. So it was like when you get your first uh, slap to the face of reality, where you completed twenty thousand dollar job, and you've only been paid two thousand dollars. And you can't do anything at all until the insurance just decides that they're going to pay you three months down the road because they felt like it that day and didn't feel like it the last 90 days. You know, <laughs> like, uh, that's really difficult to work with. Right. So you lose you lose your ability to create accounts with, uh, you know, with your suppliers, your vendors. You know, I, you know, I, I can I can stand here as a. A testament to what willpower will do at this point. I've never not paid a vendor. I've never not paid an employee. I've never had to um, um, downsize. I've never had to cut personnel. Um, almost did one time. 
uh, you were on the receiving end of that. That was three years ago. Um, two two different people because we were just we thought we were going to lose, and then we ended up being able to bring back. And you know, I, I'm I'm really proud about that. But there is an incredible amount of really challenges that you're just not expecting when you go into business. So that's why I say you got to have a lot of willpower, and you got to have guy or girl. You got to have some balls. I, th- I think that some of the early challenges, uh, some of, like, the stuff that I did of, like, there's not a roadmap of, like, so Colorado doesn't have state licensing for roofers. Um, it's something we would love. Mm-hmm. Um, but we don't have any, so, like, and this is any industry. Not every industry is regulated, like, plumbing and electricity. Of, like, those are licensed by the state, and you have to carry these licenses and those things to be able to perform this work. Um, that doesn't exist for roofers. Mm -hmm. It's up to the municipality. Mm -hmm. So, and then there's not a roadmap for it. It happens this way in this city and this way in this city and that way in that city. Like they're not all the same. They all have different things that they require. I mean, even down to code and knowing, you know, just in the area we work of like, if I, if I think about within 20 miles of the office, Mm -hmm. um, there's three different codes um, within 20 miles of us of like places that require well, higher level of things and like th- that. There's three different code, you know, I, I, ICC codes that they're working off of, and there's also different verbiage per municipality, right? Yeah. So in 20 miles, you got 30 different towns, and you have to somehow learn how to interpret 20 different towns worth of code and, and be able to maneuver and understand that they work off of different portals. They work off of the other different personnel. They have different requirements. Like this one, you have to email them. This one, you have to walk in with a check and a piece of paper. This one, you got to do this, X, Y, and Z. Like, yeah, there's there's no cartographer creating you a roadmap in in business. And so this is for us. It's industry specific, but that's that's the thing. You gotta you gotta kind of just be willing to get your get your hands dirty, figure it out. Correct, because that that bureaucratic work, for lack of a better term, is. In every industry, there's going to be requirements for insurance in every industry of, mm-hmm. like, PDR is going to have a completely different type of insurance than we have to carry. Mm-hmm. And things like that of, like, there's, you know, so there's going to be those challenges, and there's not necessarily a roadmap for anyone. Mm-hmm. So part of, you know, going for the stream of being an entrepreneur and doing these things is making sure that, like, okay, I know I need to do these things and how to tackle them. And so you're going to run into those challenges because there's going to be places where, like, I'm just going to wholesale online. Well, that comes with its own whole set of regulation that you have to comply with of, like, how do you do that properly and, like, how do you compete with other big companies that already do that? Mm -hmm. Um, So everyone is going to have those challenges off of the first year of, like, market entry. But then, like, specifically product development. I know in our first couple of years that we worked with um, some brands that we don't currently work with anymore Mm -hmm. um, because that was what was available to us because the others were unattainable. Mm -hmm. Um, And so there's some of that that I don't... Like, when you're first getting started of, like, I want to sell this brand, um, that brand isn't always available to you. Mm -hmm. Um, Right from the start. Yeah, um, I mean, and it could be, but you're going to pay a very high price for it, which correct. means you're not going to be able to win the job, you know, that kind of stuff. Like, you're you're forced to be able to work at your level, yeah. right? I mean, you're new, so, I mean, pee on. Yeah, so <laughs> we, I mean, there was a lot of that of, like, you work with where you can be competitive because mm-hmm. that's the other part of it is competition is a big part of this, and... So we had to, you know, you have to sell what you can sell. Mm-hmm. Um, what allows you to be competitive in this market, in whatever market you're working in and working through those challenges. Um, I think that that's been a thing that as we've evolved, we've found these new places mm-hmm. where we fit. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's, you know, we've been doing it long enough now that we're selling the product that we originally wanted to sell. Mm-hmm. And we're able to be competitive yeah. um, in that market. Um And so, but we had to learn how to navigate that. And we've built really great relationships with those people now that we're able to because we stuck to our code of ethics. I think that's the other thing is we have a really, I mean, in our conference room, um, and part of the reason that I believe that we're so successful is that code of ethics is 
front and center of the conference room, great big on the wall. Mm-hmm. And all of our guys have to look at it every day they come in here mm-hmm. and go into that conference room. Um, I think I, so I think that's one of the most important things that you can do. If you're trying to, if you're thinking about taking the jump um, into whatever endeavor that it is, entrepreneurial endeavor, and you're trying to open this business, and you got this idea. It you know don't, I don't want to make it sound like everybody you know you got to jump through so many hoops. There are there are low barrier entry businesses to get into. There's easier ways to 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 skin the cat than the path that we chose. There's harder ways and there's easier ways. Like you, you there's there's all kinds of stuff. You you pick your poison, but I, I think the only way you can truly <laughs> the only way you can truly influence your success is by f- figuring out your foundational principles. And understanding your why and making sure that that is embedded in those principles. And if you stay consistent with that and you stay hard-nosed with it, like it, it doesn't break, it doesn't bend, doesn't break, this is this is how we do business, it will carry you a long ways. And our, our, our code of ethics, you know, it's written in our mission statement that we're going to remain unapologetically ethical, right? Unapologetically, uh, unapologetically ethical. And we wrote that on purpose. And, and I... I that was a term term that that I, I thought of when we were writing the mission statement, and the reason we like we had worked for a couple of different roofing companies between the two of us prior to this, and we had learned a lot from those guys. But what we learned every time that wasn't good experience was that they were cheating the system, right? And we found out that you know the the world of contracting there's there are some great people in the world of contracting, but they 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 are outnumbered by real shitbirds, right? And especially when you get into insurance restoration, because now somebody else is funding it, and it looks like an unlimited pot of money. Mm-hmm. So you got shitheads mixed with greedy people, right? So they just give the industry an incredibly bad name, and we found out we just didn't stand for the same things that they did, and so. We wouldn't have actually started this business at the point that we did and, and, until I told Chris, I am not doing this anymore. We're either going into business or I'm going back to the gym. It was a uh-uh, impasse. We're, we're not going. And so that's why the principle was the way that it was. Is like, we're going to do this different. And not only are we going to do it different, we're being so freaking good at it that everybody else has to do what we have to do, right? And so the unapologetically ethical piece uh, building every roof as those for your mother is very important to us because, you know, I was r- not my whole life, but a majority of my life. And then, you know, I've had my stepdad and stuff, but I was raised by a single mother, right? And she means the world to me. So if I'm going to build my mom's roof, it's going to be the best damn roof that you ever got. So not not everybody has that relationship. Chris had a similar relationship with his mom. So it made sense to us to put these these principles and these mottos and these things in place because it was like, this is what I want. I want you to be treated like family when I work for you. And that way, every time, you know, every time that you think about the service that we offered, the only thing you want to do is offer that, offer the opportunity for us to, to, to do that for somebody else. The word of mouth comes out of that, right? Like yeah. it's the law of stratospheric success. Like we want to serve you. We want to serve you so well that you just can't stop talking about it. And it ends up being that, you know, not only to work well here, but we can expand and we can work off of that. Absolutely. Um, So mentors and advisors. um, I think both of us have had really incredible uh, mentors that um, influenced our decisions. Mm. And so part of entrepreneurs finding, being a, a great entrepreneur is finding that influential the influential mentor who can really refine like what you said of like bringing you into the cells. And so just speaking to that a little bit more of like where, where did you see the most value from having that mentorship as far as um, for your, for in, you know, in our first five years of where did that influence really help? Mm. Uh, this is a hard question to answer because my mentor, the one that I always, you know, I've, I've repeatedly talked about him. I hope he watches these. Every, you know, we've kind of, we haven't worked, we haven't talked in a long time um, because he told me not to start this business. Mm. <laughs> so that's why I say it's a hard to say, you know, it's a hard thing to say. Actually, a lot of friends and family members, um, that's the interesting part about going out on your own. Um, a lot of them were advocating against me going out on my own um, because they were trying to protect me, mm-hmm. right? I had a young baby that I'm responsible for. 
you know, and I had a, I had an easy route to stay comfortable um, working in, in the gym industry, but I had lost, I had lost all excitement for it. I was, I had been wronged enough times that I was just like, I don't, I don't want to be here anymore. Not like on this earth. I'm just saying like in this industry, right? And a lot of people actively campaigned for me to not be here because I didn't, because I, I didn't grow up wanting to be Bob the Builder, mm-hmm. right? And they're like, you need to follow your ha- passion, follow your heart. But what, I forced it. I was like, I'm going to do this. And then they all came around eventually. And they started, you know, giving me more guidance and, and working with me and the, the times and stuff that I really needed a sounding board and that kind of stuff. But that's because they realized that I would pulled a Christian, Right, and <laughs> anybody who knows who I am is like, if I set my mind to something, I it, I don't give a shit what it is. You're gonna put it in my way. I'm gonna blow through it, right? And so, here we are, right? And so, um, you know, people were advocating against me not being here, and, and it felt really hard. It was really difficult at the beginning, and that's what everybody that listens to this, if they're thinking that they're gonna go out on their own, it's like, not all good, adv- all advice is good advice. Know who you are and know what you stand for, right? And if it's coming from somebody you respect, respectfully say. I disagree, and that's it. You don't have to make a fight out of it and lose your resources and that kind of stuff. But it's like, look, if this is what you want, and you can't, you can't sleep, you can't eat, you can't breathe without thinking about it. Just go out and fucking do it, right? And so, with the mentorship, it, it's very, very, very valuable. If you guys read, um, I think it's Robert Green uh, wrote a book called Mastery. Mastery is about the 10,000 hours concept. Um, 10,000 hours, there's a huge segment of the 10,000 hour book that's talking about um, apprenticeship, right? Uh, the mentor mentee relationship. And so it, the concept in this book is, and that, that it talks about is like the CEO who uh, excelled, you know, climbed the ladder to the highest story of the penthouse suite you know, of the, of the big building, the skyscraper, whatever, it took him 50 years to get there. But when he's ready to retire, he brings on an apprentice that he sees whatever he sees in that person. And he trains them everything that they knew in 50 years within a six month to two month or two year time span or whatever, right? A very short time span in comparison to 50 years of growth. And why is that? It's because there's a difference between knowledge and wisdom. Knowledge you acquire through your own trial and error. Wisdom is given to you because it was learned from their trial and error. It's like avoid this, you know, do this, avoid this, do this, avoid this, uh, test this, and if it gives you this result, then go this direction. If it gives you this result, go this direction. They've got the experience. It's very important to reach out to the people who you know who can give you gentle, or not gentle, sometimes it's forceful, but good guidance in the right direction. Okay, so speaking of the mentorship type of deal, Mm -hmm. um, I actually would go as far to say, because I've had many mentors through my career, um, being a creative, uh, doing photos, doing videos, all that, all the time. Um, I think there's a point, though, especially as you see technology progressing, things like that, uh, do you think it's possible to really over, really, the master is now the, the master, if you will, the, the, the teacher is now the master. Or what, you, you know what I'm saying? There's a phrase I'm the forgetting. The Kung Fu Panda finally became the dragon. Yeah, pretty much, 100%. <laughs> so I'm curious what your thought is on that. Um, I think it I think it solely depends on the relationship with the mentor, right? Because it like if you have a business mentor in the business that you're in, yeah, you can definitely eclipse them. And honestly, they should encourage that. Right, that should be the goal. Yeah. Right? If you bring somebody under your wing, your goal should be make them better than you. Right. Yeah, and that's that's always been my goal. Um, as a creative, I'm like, cool. I have this camera. I have this thing. I've done and shot this. I've always wanted to one up the person I've been working with. Um, yeah. Always the case. Um, yeah. Sometimes it's ended poorly, and then other <laughs> times it's ended quite well, and I'm still friends with them. But yeah. um, you some, know, there should be nice. some healthy competition. But that, I mean, that's. That's the give back that I was talking about before. It's like this person has benefited from their time. Um, they should be doing this out of, out of like, A, they believe in you, and B, they want to continue that legacy into the world. And if they've turned you into a better version of themselves, like them but better, you know, 2.0, they did they did it. That should be an accomplishment for both the mentor and the mentee, absolutely. But when I say the relationship is the important part, it's because there's a lot of people in my life who give me great guidance, but they have 
zero direct correlation to what I do, right? Like they're not building roofs for a living. They're not doing exterior or construction. So, I mean, what do you base that off of is maybe your success level, maybe the value of your bank account. I don't know, but that seems pretty fickle, right? So, but I think, I think that, I think that absolutely you should, be on a quest to surpass your mentor and they should want you to get there. Excellent. I like uh, using the phrase quest yeah. at any point in time. That's always a, <laughs> a me thing. But to get JD back in here, that's yeah. may happen. Vision quest, baby. <laughs> boo, 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 boo. <laughs> uh, Let's do the Scooby-Doo ending. <laughs> no. <laughs> Let's do the Thelma and Louise. Yeah. Sorry. Wayne's World references here. Uh, We're going back to the early 90s, bud. Going back to movies, I don't know. Um, I've seen Wayne's World. I just don't remember it. Um, That was Lachlan, by the way. Um, He is our uh, resident videographer and then also producer role, so... We wanted he wanted to jump in here, so we brought him in. He is um, much more creative than I will ever be. That's yes, hundred <laughs> um, percent. And then I think uh, when we're talking about this first uh, part of this, of what was the validating part? What was the that validated the business idea? Um, the steps that we took to like validate ourselves inside the market, and then the feedback and how the feedback from like initial homeowners or vendors or people that um, we just had interactions with, how did that shape what we became? Hmm. I'm not sure how to best answer that validation. Um, like you're talking maybe milestones that were crossed. It could be, mi- it could be milestones and it could just be the, the way that we started to understand that we were doing this the way that we set out mm-hmm. to do it. Mm-hmm. Um, and that we we were on the right trajectory of we were moving towards what we wanted to create. Yeah. Um, well, there's always monetary uh, milestones, and the biggest one really was like when you when I realized, hey, this isn't something that is going to be short lived. Is when we essentially hired ourselves. Okay. Right at the point where we had the amount of cash flow to dedicate a salary that's a continuous salary. Like before that, it's like, how much money do we make this week, and how much do we have to go out? And okay, we got fifteen bucks left. Like here's your <laughs> seven fifty. Here's my seven fifty. <laughs> you know, like, good luck, ramen. We're only gonna get <laughs> half as many ramens this week. You know, <laughs> um, but anyways, it, it may not have been that bad. But there are plenty of times where it was like, it was rough. Right. Um, but that, that was a big milestone was hiring ourselves. And I mean, it's all, you know, we W two'd ourselves and we changed the, the, you know, the mechanism of how we were paid and we had cash flow to support that. And we started bringing in employees when we had the ability to have, to let ourselves obligate ourselves to paying somebody else. That's a big milestone to cross. Um, some people avoid it for forever. Actually, I met a gentleman, um, recently who's been running a one-man operation for like 17 years and i was like bro you're getting a little old to do this by yourself i'm like he everybody knows you you could you could get bigger than this and you could pull yourself out of the field hand and the salesperson and the ar guy and all this stuff and he's like i just don't think i can handle the responsibility and it's like it's the wrong mindset right yeah uh, you gotta have that abundance mindset and understand i believe in myself and i believe in myself enough that i know that if i need to complete something i will complete something right um but validation in the field um i would say um when our suppliers started thoroughly recognizing us and started to seek us out mm. right when vendors and suppliers and people started to seek us out and wanted to partner with us instead of us always being on the like uh, recruiting end of every sale. That was a big deal because it's like, oh shit, we're being noticed. Like we're doing something, right? That was a big deal. Um, and then another another big milestone was when we um, made enough money to move out of work operating out of houses and coming here. That was a big deal because it, it, it just gave us a it gave us a home base, right? And having a home base and having a place where you can have your all your thoughts and all the things collide in one place, and then you go out and you execute. That was it was very powerful. Before that, it was very discombobulated. Now we have the ability to create efficiencies and have 
have that central nervous system, so to speak, and operate from the brain out to the body. That's a big deal. Awesome. I think that, um, you know, as we talk about the startup phase and then as we work through uh, the next the next few parts of this conversation, um, it's just, it's really interesting and I think very powerful to hear specifically from you because, you know, you're the head of this, of what is driving us forward. And even though that, like, like you said, of like I didn't really see myself in construction. Um, I, I I'm in the same boat. I was I told the same thing. You're gonna be a, like you should be an engineer. Like I, to, I was told that a lot throughout my childhood, and things like that. And that's why I went into audio. But um, that validation that you get from like I'm just going to do this thing because I'm gonna I'm gonna this is what I'm doing mm-hmm. and pushing for it and. You know, the, f- the initial startup part is what we're working through right now of, like, that first, those first few years of, like, really establishing who we are and then moving into this building, I think, is a really, really powerful place to um, kind of kind of close here. And then we're going to talk more about the growth and development of the organization or the growth and development as you're building something as we move forward. Talk a, little, talk a little bit about some growing pains. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, so. <laughs> Sounds good. Um, I know that we would love to hear uh, in the comments from uh, anyone that tuned in this week uh, who has gone through the same thing as us, the, intru- the entrepreneur, or has questions. We would love to have that interaction with you guys, answer some questions, and um, really, really dive into this initial, like, how do I get started? Um, we'd love to have that conversation with you guys. Let us know if you have any questions or comments. Leave them uh, below the video here on YouTube or put them in the comments over on Instagram. Right on, right on, right on. Well, yeah, thank you for tuning in to another episode of Into the Lion's Den with uh, JD and Christian. Um, we really appreciate all of the engagement that we've gotten so far. I've been actually getting some interesting comments, uh, generally not in the comments, but from just in weird networks of people where people have been saying things like, hey, I keep seeing, you know, those are great videos, blah, blah, blah. Um, those of you guys that are watching, this is my plea to you. If you're watching and you're not actually helping us by liking it or subscribing or like putting a comment in, you're doing it as, us a disservice. So you actually like what we're doing. Please actually do a little bit, like just press a button, right? Just press a button. The, the like is huge. I mean, you've seen it in every YouTube video from every Smash creator. Smash that like button. Exactly. And, and, and I'm not going to bait it like they do on you, <laughs> kids' YouTube. Like, oh, if you love your mom and don't want her to die, press like right now. You know, that kind of bullshit. Like, I'm not going to do that to you guys, but I'm saying it's going to help us grow organically this business, this idea. We can expand. We can reach farther. Um, and we can get more, you know, guests on here, the more validation that we get in this kind of podcast. So press, press like, I know you're watching. I know you're watching. Press like, okay. All right. right. Anyways, that's it for now. Uh, thank you for everything. Catch you on the flip side. See you guys.